Good afternoon and welcome to uh, OAG's latest webinar. Uh, I'm Becca Rowland, I'm a partner with Midas Aviation, I'm going to be hosting today's webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, today we're going to be looking at alliances and partnerships and um, it, as, as we normally do, we repeat this uh, webinar, we do one in the morning, one in the afternoon in the UK. Um, so this is the second one today. Um, one of our guests wasn't our guest wasn't able to join us this morning so uh, thankfully he's with us today so um if you were hoping to catch him this morning and you've joined us today then uh, then uh, it, it should be good um in the three years we've been doing these webinars we realize we haven't really talked about alliances and so um it's quite timely i think to to have a discussion and to just sort of see where we've got to um in the world of alliances and partnerships um and as always we'll be drawing on sort of the, the massive data that oeg has um, so, um, as you've seen in the um, uh, promotional material, um, we're going to be looking at how do the Alliance Networks compare today, um, you, you know, we're, we're past the pandemic, what's changed, what's, uh, what's different, what are the trends that we've got there. Um, we're going to touch on what are the benefits of partnerships and, and the alliances, and whether there are network gaps to fill, and is that even an appropriate question. Um, we'll be taking questions as we go, as we always do, so please just use the chat function to send your questions in and we'll try and pick them up as we go and that way we can keep them nice and relevant and topical as, as we're discussing this, uh, this interesting subject area. Uh, joining me today, as always, we've got John Grant, OEG's Chief Analyst. Uh, welcome back, John. You've been in Australia for what feels like forever, haven't you? Uh, it was only three and a half weeks, but hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, if you're in the Americas. Yes, um, travelled the globe, um, seen the rock, uh, swam the reef. Yep, so uh, melted down the credit card and back to work, I'm afraid. Well, we're, we're glad to have you back and uh, I'm sure you'll have lots to, to tell us today. And with us, uh, we've got uh, Dan Gain um, from Sky Team. Um, Dow, it's, it's good that you can join us. You're actually in Mauritius, aren't you, uh, at the moment, and, and about to travel on to China, I gather. So you're a, another globe-trotting uh, member of the aviation establishment. Yeah, I, I try to minimise as much as I can because of the uh, uh, carbon zero policies, etc. But I'm traveling only on the most uh, important meetings. So for you to know, I'm not in the honeymoon in Mauritius. I'm here for, for business. Okay, okay. Well, it's, it's good to have you with us and um, thank you very much. We know that Sky Team, we've, we've seen Sky Team people regularly attending the webinars and it's um, it, it does make us think we should get a view from Sky Team as to um, how you see the world of, of alliances today. So uh, thanks for, for joining us. Um, as always, we'll start with just a look at what's happening in the industry generally. Um, we, as we've always said, we look at capacity because it gives us a view of, of the future as well as the past. Um, it's not perfect, but um, it's not changing as much as it was, is it, John? The, the numbers are looking, uh, the charts are looking quite similar month to month now, aren't they? They are, Becca. We've, uh, we've got past that horrible period of dramatic churn from almost week to week and airlines quite frequently drop in 10, 15 percent of their capacity six to eight weeks before the date that it was supposed to be flown so much more stability in in the networks which is really positive um i don't think and i think it's quite likely that oh very unlikely we will exceed 2019's capacity levels uh, this summer and probably through the winter as well a uh, couple of reasons for this you know um and, and not entirely the airline's fault or directly the airline's fault. Um, there are some real issues with performance of particular engine types that are impacting airlines around the world at the moment. Uh, I sense a little bit of a softening in demand um, in North America, particularly in the domestic market. And I think there's just um, a, the ongoing issue of wider resources, availability of skilled personnel, uh it, it's all making for you know a very tightly constrained market um in terms of capacity good for the airlines uh because i think you know we are still seeing good load factors and high yields uh and operating costs are coming down so you've got to think that profitability is going to be good through the summer months for most carriers not all there will always be some that struggle uh but i think i think in that context we're going to be five, maybe six percent below where we were in two, 2019. 
but we keep forgetting that if it wasn't for the pandemic, then in a normal four year time period, we would probably expect capacity to have grown by between seven and eight, maybe even 10% uh, by this point. So rather than um, 500 million seats a month uh, that we see in the Julys and August, we would have perhaps been expecting 540, maybe 550 million seats. So whilst we're 6%, maybe 5, 6% down uh, this year, in reality, against where we would have been with organic growth, we're probably 15, 16% behind what would have been the natural curve. Um, if we had not uh, endured the pandemic for the last three years. Uh, and interesting, John, I, I know you're saying maybe five, six percent below um, 2019 capacity is, is really as good as we should hope to see it um, this year. And I think you said this morning that even that might be being optimistic. Um, I, I guess we, because the capacity is a bit constrained because of all these other issues, which we will touch on, um, We'd expect loads to be quite high, but I'm really interested. That I think it's the first time you've said that you think um, demand is softening. Uh, what what makes you think that? Uh, just the sentiment from the first quarter, uh, first set of quarterly earnings reports for 2023 from some of the airline CEOs and particularly the US uh, carriers. Now, remember that they were ahead of everyone else in the curve and in the recovery and performed very strongly and domestic demand was very strong. But they're beginning to say that there's a soft, they, they sense a softening in demand. Um, and even now, uh, I'm seeing stories of availability um, and excess supply um, as we head into the US holiday season. So rates are coming down to, to more normal levels. Um, that revenge spend period is over. People are back at work. There's more people going back into the workforce than there were uh, previously. Um, the world's returning to its sort of normal economic um, conditions, and, and you know, it's lucky that we have had that capacity discipline. Uh, but if you look at some airfares going into the last quarter of this year, and you look even further ahead into the first quarter of 2024. Airfares are getting back to the same selling levels as they used to be in uh, that 2019 timeframe. So there's an expectation that the market's softening. Now, you know, airlines could sell those seats out very quickly and the market um, strengthens and they can kick in their revenue management parameters. But it looks like airlines are um, expecting to see um, a softening of demand, I think. And it's, you know, it's not going to be huge, it's not going to be significant, but if it nudges down load factors by a couple of percent, um, then the yields are going to fall accordingly to um, try and sustain demand levels that we've seen in the past. Dow, do you have a, a, a view at SkyTeam or are you, you tracking any trends in terms of demand softening? Yeah, no, I, I'm fully I agree with uh, John. On top of that, if you consider, without the pandemic, if you consider a natural growth, work wise with 5% per year times three or four years, uh, I do think that some carriers will have an additional effort, uh, uh, financially speaking, to uh, come back to the uh, same level. Because if you look at the numbers of A280, that has been sent back. Uh, uh, a few members, big one, takes the opportunity to rationalize or to look at the fleet strategy in different way. So they will replace one airplane H-O-A-T with two, 350 or 377 uh, uh, So financially speaking, it's a no uh, And those carriers have to decide uh, carefully how they will compensate the capacity of 280 with kind of aircraft to deploy where? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. The, uh, the, uh, the, the A380s take a, a lot of capacity out of the market, don't they? Yeah, I um, think... Go on, John. I think from another perspective, we've been, we've been quite lucky in terms of... Um, we've spoken for the last six months about capacity discipline and how disciplined the airlines have been about capacity and whilst that's the case now you know that is that is 
more frustration now for the airline community than perhaps discipline because for a number of factors they just cannot put the production back into the sky that perhaps they wanted to um, be it um, changing fleets and rationalization of fleets and networks um, or be it just literally delivery schedules from Boeing and Airbus that are causing immense frustration for many airlines around the world who just have no real clear picture on when they can expect aircraft to be delivered. It's, you know, it's becoming more and more like a baby. You know it's due, but you don't have any any precise idea of what day it's going to arrive. Yeah, I, I think I'm a, I'm a bit sceptical about whether there was ever capacity discipline. I think it's always been a little bit forced on, on the airlines, first through labour shortages and, and other factors, and now, and now the problems with with aircraft, but we'll we'll come on to that. Um, let's have a look at the capacity by uh, region. Um, for those of you who who join our webinars regularly, we the last I don't know six months or so we've been using lines for this chart, but it's all getting a bit busy. So we've just selected three months: May 2019, May 2020, and May 23 uh, to look at where capacity is for each region. And you know, mixed results: Europe down a bit, but that's partly the the Russia effect. Um, Asia. Uh, almost up to where it was in 2019, um, but that's due to China domestic, whereas China international is still down quite a bit. North America just again shy of where it was in 2019. So, um, and Africa and Latin America doing doing quite well. Um, th these are just trends that are going to keep keep getting a bit more of the same, aren't they, John? They are, and um, you know when you put a slide up like this, Becca, it's. Uh... The devil is always in the detail rather at the rather than at summary level isn't it you know africa africa performed very well during the pandemic relative to other parts of the world um you know there's been some new airlines um starting routes west africa's performed strongly uh, east africa's done very well but obviously south african airways collapsed uh and that market's in transition if you look in asia it's all about the the flip in the chinese domestic network um, and the big question, of course, is when does that become or return to more international capacity? And if so, will it be as large as it previously was? Uh, I don't think we know the answer yet. It's uh, taking longer, I think, for many um, international markets to restart from China. Um, although the European airlines are now beginning uh, to re-enter the Chinese market, but face immense difficulties with the routines um, to avoid Russian airspace, etc. Europe, we're down 7%, um, some real laggards there in terms of re reopening their networks and getting back to 2019 production levels. Lufthansa still significantly behind the market. Uh, you've got the rationalization of the ITA stroke Alitalia network. British Airways are still behind the curve. And at the same time, you've got Ryanair who, you know, have just continued to stretch ahead of every one of their competitors. Um, Ryanair are relentless. They are like the Manchester City um, of the aviation world. You know, they just keep on winning and they keep on going. And why, when you think you're ahead of them, they come and take over and lead the battle once again. So, um, you know, Michael O'Leary and his uh, order last week for even more 737 Maxes um, is an interesting um, position we're going to have to watch. Latin America has been strong. Middle East. Um, you know, we've got more low cost capacity going in there, not just from Middle East carriers, but you've got Wizz Air, of course, who started Wizz Air Abu Dhabi, Wizz Air flying into Saudi Arabia, fly Dubai, the Indian low cost carriers. Yeah, it's a fascinating scene in all of these places. We could do a webinar on each one of these regions individually and, and happily fill an hour's time, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think so. Interesting with, with Europe, you, you don't mention, the, you referred to, to Lufthansa there and, and you know, they've been quite slow bringing capacity back. What role do you think is, that is, is there for there's a reduction in domestic flying within Central Europe? You know, the, sort of uh, the, the sustainability arguments that are sort of yeah. beginning to persuade people to, to take the train instead. Is that, is that a well, factor here, that quite small, small fry compared to the other? <laughs> I think the sustainability, it comes from different angles, doesn't it? I mean, the sustainability issue in France, um, limiting uh, flights of less than, I think, was it uh, 100 kilometers or 100, 200 kilometers, something like that, and having to uh, be use a, a train service. Those were ideal routes to experiment with electric aircraft over the next 10 years. Um, that, you know, that would have been an ex interesting experiment. Um, 
and it's just encouraged non-French um, carriers such as BA and Lufthansa to start operating to those points and take connecting flows. Uh, so that's the point. I, you know, I can't, and Dow's closer to it than I think anyone with the Sky Team head office in in Amsterdam. I can't really fathom for for any real common sense the Dutch government's sudden imposition of capacity constraints on on Schiphol Airport and and KLN. You know, this is an industry that that works on planning cycles of five or six years for fleet plans. And a government steps into a discussion and says overnight, you're gonna to have to reduce your flying by 20%. I mean, that, that, that just is not joined up thinking for the wider economy. Um, so you, you have that and you have, you know, um, more use of train services in Germany. So there's certainly other external factors that are, are driving what's happening in Europe, but you know, make, make no mistake, in the next eight weeks, half of Europe will fly from the north to the south and go on holiday. Um, and that will always be the case. And there'll always be a need for air service. Okay. So before we start looking at some data around alliances, we did want to touch on, on this um, issue that John's already mentioned about um, aircraft um, 737 MAX issues, A220 engine issues, um, we had delays with the, the Dreamliner deliveries, which I, I think are, are, are back happening now. But we're not going to see, uh, certainly from Boeing, the number of aircraft being delivered uh, that perhaps have been planned or expected. And uh, this is going to be a problem that's going to roll out over the next six months, year, two years, isn't it? And, and cause capacity constraints in the industry. Love the way you use the word roll out there. That's uh, very appropriate <laughs> in the context of this, isn't it? Yes, it's. Um... It's going to be a struggle, isn't it, for everyone? I mean, Boeing have clearly not solved all of their problems about deliveries um, and indeed the technical um, performance and reliability of some of the aircraft they're delivering. And they're going to produce, I think the latest estimate is about only half of the, the originally anticipated Q2 deliveries, uh, which of course snowballs back for every other airline. And then you get Ryanair placing another big order uh, last week. So they've got problems. Um, the A220, which is becoming a workhorse for many airlines uh, around the world, you know, it's the right size aircraft for many routes. It's got a good product. It's very efficient. It can do short sectors. It can do very long sectors. The Pratt & Whitney engines are not performing as expected, requiring more frequent uh, maintenance checks and overhauls. Um, leading to some airlines having to completely revise their schedules. Iraq Airways have, have dropped all four uh, A220 aircraft they have from their network. KLM City Hopper have had to readjust their summer 2023 program. And in their particular case, you know, they're a, they're a connecting carrier to a long haul network in Amsterdam. And there will be many people who will already have booked with the KLM Sky Team group using a city hopper service who may now have to either rebook or be reprotected or some change to their travel plans, um, which is frustrating for them, but also very frustrating for city hopper and the revenues they would have generated. It's, it's not good news. Um, and it's not good news because not only do we know when these aircraft are going to be delivered, Every time they arrive, they need to be fitted out. You know, they need to have the seats put in them. They need to have the galleys um, checked out and fitted, whatever it happens to be. And that takes sometimes another four to six weeks. And if the air airline doesn't know when the aircraft's being delivered, asking their um, cabin fit out teams to be available and their suppliers to be available and the seats to be in place at the right time um, just pushes the whole issue further down the track and makes it more difficult for everyone. So the table we've uh, we, we put in here um, was, like, I guess, because we were seeing quite a lot of publicity and, and media coverage about the 8020 engine issue, um, and including for KLM City Hopper. Um, and, and I was interested to see, you know, how much is this affecting other airlines? Um, so we've just taken for the month of May, uh, there's a list of um, the number of that aircraft type that each of these airlines have, and that data's come from CAPA. Um, so thank you, CAPA. And, um, and the other data is just the average 
time per aircraft in the air um, it may not be you know exactly right if some of those aircraft are, are parked and we don't know that they are but th there's a, a wide variation there it doesn't seem like this issue is affecting all the airlines the same JetBlue down there at B6 and, and Delta are still getting pretty good aircraft utilization at least in terms of what's being scheduled for these aircraft so is it is it an issue for some airlines in particular um, more so than others um, and there are other factors at play here so Air Baltic which is BT um, had an extensive network to Russia, uh, which obviously for the last 12 months hasn't flown. Um, so, you know, they, they've developed some long haul routes into the Canaries um, and they've expanded their position in the, in the wider Baltic market. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's partly driving their current utilization. Um, and then you've got other carriers, as you mentioned, like Delta, um, who are still racking up good hours. Um, I think the frustration for all of these is, you know, this is an aircraft that can do all sorts of great sectors and, and flying for them. And it's just the uncertainty that's now been created um, in the market. None of these aircraft are old enough that they're going in for heavy maintenance checks now. This is purely an engine related issue at the moment. Okay. Okay, let's um, move on and, and look at alliances. Um, we've um, what we've done here is um, on the left we've got a chart just showing capacity back since 2003 for the three main alliances, which make up you know all but about two percent of uh, I think other other alliances make up about two percent of, of global capacity. Um, all three of them um, take a big hit in 2020, 2021, and then are, are bouncing back. Um, Pretty much as the industry is. I, I did look at some numbers earlier today. Um, they haven't come, certainly at the end of 2022, capacity for these three alliances haven't come back quite as much as for the industry as a whole, um, but, but wasn't far off. And then on the right here, we've looked at the capacity share by alliance and by what else is in the market. So we've got the non-aligned low-cost carriers, obviously they're, they're non-aligned, non-aligned legacy carriers, and then this dark yellow is, is just the other alliances and the affiliates. I think what we're seeing, John, is, is that as the low-cost carrier share gets bigger, the, the, the alliances have been squeezed a bit, haven't they? I think, I guess that's inevitable. Um, squeezed or stabilized, I think, their share of, of global capacity has nudged up a little bit over the last 20 years and, you know, it has been higher at some point um, and obviously towed back a little bit since 2020. Um, and that's been because some carriers have left alliances. Uh, but I, I think the other thing, Becca, is the growth in the, the non-aligned low cost carriers. Uh, that's where much of the action has been around the world in the last decade. Uh, that's the growing segment. Um, and, you know, the, uh, for me, the interesting thing is if you look at the non-aligned legacy carriers, we've probably got a list there of about 300, 400 airlines around the world, um, some of which will have a geographic uh, position or nuance, people like Vidaro, perhaps, uh, in Norway, who are serving very regional communities and similar airlines, some with PSO, public service obligations. Um, that help them in their networks. But a lot of those non-aligned carriers are, you know, relatively small, quite a few are state owned, um, many of them are unprofitable. And, and from an alliance perspective, and I'm sure Dow can tell us more about this, would they actually add more value to the alliance than they would burden in terms of administration, effort, coordination, resources to bring them into an alliance you know sometimes sometimes i feel it would be better for an alliance to align itself with a low-cost carrier um, and a hybrid carrier than it would to try and find a new legacy member yes but i i think that this is also another effect uh, that you the floor you have to adjust to local carrier to uh, grab a bit more market share and capacity. Uh, uh, the topic is a consolidation. Uh, the last 10 years, uh, even though a bit more than 10 years, when you have a lot of uh, um, consolidation in the US and Europe, is you know, you, when you put two carriers together, you are not increasing from the sum of the two. 
So you have the first phase of rationalization, and then step by step growing uh, uh, could be completely adapted to the market. So every time you rationalize the capacity of two carriers, you give the floor and you give opportunities for low-cost carriers to appear on those ONDs that you have, uh, uh, I would say, uh, rationalize the, the, the capacity. So the do double effect, the cost regulation, and the other one is also the, the success of the uh, uh, so-called low-cost give appetite to some entities to take a risk to launch the uh, uh, local service of the long haul. Yeah, I think that's that's, uh, it, that's a really good point. Um, we've got some more numbers about the three alliances, or the three major alliances anyway. Um, we've got some numbers here for, for membership, and I know Sky Team might have 20 if we include Aeroflot, which is suspended. I know we've got a question, which maybe we can come to in a moment about that. But Dow, your your view is, if any, I mean, it, this is even 19 or 20 airlines is quite a lot to have in a membership, isn't it? And you've really, if if you were to think about adding a member, you've really got to know what value they bring in terms of extra destinations, what geographic coverage. Um, I get the sense from talking to you previously that, that that actually it would take quite a lot to to bring in another member at this point. That this you know the, the coverage you have is is pretty much what you need, and the coverage for each of the alliances is not dissimilar really. Completely, yeah, yeah, completely. Uh, from the beginning, uh, Sky Team strategy was uh, not increasing membership just for the sake of increasing. We want to focus on the uh, kind of key cashmere area in the uh, region to have one strong members, or at least the, sell the challenge of the flag carriers uh, to cover that cashmere area. Um, and we didn't have the ambition to, to, to increase the number of members just for increasing because we, we want to focus on the customer experience as our motto. And then you know how difficult to align carriers uh, uh, of the commercial policies to propose the same services in order to ensure to the customer, uh, whoever uh, is operating carrier, as long as the customer is taking scatting, he or she can expect the same services. Uh, uh, and you know, there's some area that are still uh, not under the seamlessness uh, discussion. You have carriers who apply for the baggage uh, peace concept, the other one apply the weight concept. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a nightmare for the customer. Uh, so scanning, we start since a few years to align as much as we can creating services and products that serve our members and giving a kind of, you know, the notion of metal neutral. So the mm -hmm. customer has the feeling Whoever is operating the metal in terms of services is going to be the same. And this one is easy to do when you are alone. You start the challenges when you have you and another one. So if you times uh, one carrier 20 times, you can guess what is the mountain of uh, workload and challenges. So STAR has a different point of view. One work has a different strategy. As we for SCAT team, we want to cover right now our effort of the West spot. So the way we, we spent the last two, years, two or three years uh, uh, to work closely with Virgin. Uh, the UK is one of our West spot. Uh, and the best choice for the, of the UK market, uh, for sure that is a challenge of BA. So Virgin was a good fit for, for Scatim. And we continue to work on the other West spot by choosing the right candidate they're going to bring synergy to SCATI members, but also can get synergy from all those SCATI members. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really interesting. And Becca, I think this then leads on to the point that given that complexity um, that, that exists and is really, really difficult now to um, grow further and build out, why we still see many informal and indeed a growing number of informal relationships between alliance members and airlines who are outside of any alliance or perhaps are within another 
alliance because there might be a specific market need, there might be a specific weakness in a network that Dow's identified and talked about as the world grows and new markets emerge. And it's easier to work on that basis for an airline, one airline on a bilateral basis with another than try and drag 18 other members into coordinating their schedules, coordinating all their standards, procedures and policies when only one airline really sees a commercial benefit and wants to see something happen. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail uh, further on. Um, we've got a slide coming up now, um, some data that uh, Dow has, has helpfully provided. I think some of it still comes from OAG, but you, you put this slide together for us. It's slightly similar to the pie chart we've just seen, um, though this time it's, it's ASKs and it shows in 2019. It hasn't changed a lot from 2019 to 20. Um, 20, was that 23? I think I can't see the number. I've got the, the, the video hiding that part. But but I was interested in this bit at the bottom, um, Dow, that you put together to show really how much cooperation does take place. Can you talk us through what these different charts are here? Um, you've got a bar chart here with, with Star and one with, with One yes. World. What, what are you trying to show to us here? Yeah, so first of all, the two pi, uh, the two pi confirm uh, one of the previous slides where you show the share of the three global agencies and the low cost carriers plus the Northern carriers. So here, the two pi confirm the ranking. Uh, uh, regardless if we look after or before the pandemic, uh, in terms of global alliance, uh, we have STAR, followed by SCAR team, and then one more. The, the, the two uh, bar you see below is uh, the, the share of the total production of each global alliances that is offered for co-sharing amongst members. Uh, so you see over, uh, for example, you see in uh, 2019, if you look at one world, you have 36% of the total production of all one one member that is not having any code of all the one one members of this production. So roughly is one third uh, uh, for for one world and more and less than one third for 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 star uh, uh, that are. I would say not not, not having any cooperation with among other members, as the two terms are offered for co-sharing to other members. So there's the two explanations. The first one is uh, the one term showing that the level of cooperation is a kind of bilateral negotiation. So I would not say why I would give you more than you give me. So could be that reason. The second one is also the cost share is selecting active flight, A, B, and B, C. So carriers choose the connection that will allow carriers to be first displayed via GDS. But the other frequencies of the same OND will not be chosen for cost sharing because uh, they no meaning to display two or three routing. So my point is the one carrier choose, uh, 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 let's say uh, GFK Atlanta as the cost share segment beyond GFK, regardless of how many frequencies you have between GFK and Atlanta, you pick up one and that is counted in the two-third production that carriers offer for cash sharing. The other one-third can be other frequencies on GFK Atlanta that are not covered or other destinations that are the primary market of the carrier or not offer for cash sharing. That's uh, so interesting. And that's, yeah, I've not seen it done like that before. Yeah, and just add the last one is the, the, the statement you can have in mind when looking at this is every global alliance seems that they are not uh, have a full co-sharing among all members 
by having less than one third of capacity or ASK uh, to be co-chair. So there's a lot of opportunities. That why, that why you have also the uh, very small numbers, but however, quite significant for one world, uh, uh, 3.4 percent or 5 percent in 2019. One world carriers also decide to implement co-sharing with star members or SCATI members because the product have better quality in terms of connection than with their own members. Yeah, I think we, we, we've done a piece of analysis with some OEG data looking at, um, uh, sorry, there's lots of numbers, aren't there, for everybody watching here. So we've got the three alliances here, and we've just looked at the schedule for this month and said how many code shares um, partners are there within each alliance, and um, or how many flights are there that are offered within the alliance and, and with code shares outside the alliance. And it, it really... It really shows that these alliances are not exclusive clubs, are they? That that the you know behind the alliances, there's always been a certain level of pragmatism. Um, you know, it's a it's a pragmatic solution to a problem. Um, and and when an airline, as John was saying earlier, when it's beneficial to them uh, to work with a another airline that's outside their alliance, actually that's what happens, isn't it? So we've yeah, got I mean, Turkish Airlines if you're, here. If you're and, on Sorry, if you're a network planner, I was going to say, and you see an opportunity for a million dollars worth of revenue, but you have to strike a code share uh, of some commercial agreement with a carrier who's outside of your alliance, you're going to do it. Why would you not do it? You know, it, it, that, it is that pragmatism about the opportunity. There are some markets, to Dow's point about, you know, finding a, a carrier in a country who you can work with, there is only maybe one airline who dominates that market. I mean, Australia is a great example. You know, if if you work with One World, um, then that if you work with One World and within you know working with Qantas, then the only other carrier you could work with was Virgin Australia. So you worked with Virgin Australia. Um, similarly, in South America and Brazil, you know, Go had a dominant position for a very long time. It's it's commercial pragmatism. Um, at its at its finest, and it provides the greatest connectivity and options, not just for the airline, but for the passenger and the traveller. I mean, imagine what the airfares would be like to somewhere like Australia, where one airline had a had a very strong domestic position. If there was no one else, these airlines could feed. Hmm. And, and I guess history plays a role as well, doesn't it? We, We've um, talked about ourselves about China Southern, and you know they left Sky Team, and there's all the question about whether they'll go to One World. But actually, having worked with Sky Team members in the past, um, it, it's it's hard to untangle yourself, isn't it? And you know you've got relationships that work. So I think China Southern still works, particularly with KLM, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So. So, so uh, John, letting over this one, uh, indeed, uh, CZ living SCAT team, however, they kept almost all the partnership, historical partnership, uh, CZ has with all SCAT team members. Uh, and by using some product that serve the, the customer experience. Uh, here, the, the, the most, uh, first of all, uh, you are, you miss, we miss SCAT team, we miss Virgin, because uh, I think that the uh, the Virgin uh, data related to Virgin are pretty recent, uh, so you don't have in your in your uh, uh, statistic. The the most interesting thing is if you look from the carrier point of view, why do I have more? Why don't I have more than co chair than that is shown here? Because the, the carrier mindset is once I have a co-chair with one partner on one O and D, I'm happy. One itinerary or two itineraries maximum, I'm fine with that to to constitute my offering. Because if I add more mutual routing, it means that I have to add more workforce, more cost uh, to manage this one. From the customer point of view, if you say you will, I come to you as a loyal client and you offer me only one alternative from A to B. If I want to have all the routing, I cannot. So that's why you are pretty limited in terms of number of co-chair. However, 
with NDC in Thailand. And I think that airline will change their mindset. And also a kind of exclusivity policies for each global alliance. Uh, Star is very is very directive. They 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 uh, quite mandatory to have cooperation among star members, and they are pretty limited in terms of cooperation with outside of uh, uh, star. One world is completely open bar, I would say, uh, uh, very flexible. And Sky Team, we are in the middle. We are uh, some measure to a mandatory requirement to to motivate members to work together. However, the philosophy is more you are cooperating with SCATI members and more you will have the opportunity to cooperate with third party from competing agencies. Um, those policies design a bit the number of uh, uh, internal uh, cooperation co co contract versus uh, outside of the agents. Okay. Don, did you have anything to add there? Well, it, it, you know, I, th I think it, it's really interesting the approach of all of the different alliances and what they will and they will not allow, or what what how they they think about this particular issue. I think one of the things that that is increasingly interesting to me is where the role of those low cost airlines and those very large the low cost airlines who are now perhaps more hybrid models sit and facilitate regional growth and regional connectivity for each of the alliances um you know for the middle east carriers i thought it was a really what four years ago five years ago there was that big dispute with the big three u.s carriers complaining about anti-competitive behavior from the big three middle east airlines some of you might remember that and yet they were all quite happy to suck up millions of dollars of revenue in los angeles new york san francisco Chicago, wherever it happened to be, that had been fed to them by Etihad and Emirates, um, that otherwise they wouldn't have enjoyed, uh, because they operated to destinations um, that the American carriers wouldn't want to operate to. So I think I think it's it's a very evolving situation. I think carriers like JetBlue and EasyJet, who have worldwide you know distribution capability, um, are really interested in some of the other low cost carriers that are emerging around the world. Uh, I think everyone um, seems to be clamoring to find a partner in India at the moment. Every alliance would like a partner in India of some shape or form, or a commercial relationship, uh, or some selected co-chairs from alliance members with an Indigo or a SpiceJet. Um, clearly, Air India are part of Star. So it's really, really fascinating to see how this will evolve. But, but you know, that number of partnerships that are outside of alliances is definitely going to grow in the coming years. Um, that's where the growth is going to be. It's not growth within the alliances, I think. Okay, let's have a look um, at the alliance um, uh, by geography. So we've got here um, North America, South America, Europe, uh, Middle East here, Africa, and then Asia here and uh, Australasia down here. Quite different um, shares are i mean inevitably john in north america the alliances um you know are i don't know what that proportion is it's it's over you know almost two-thirds of the market isn't it um in terms of capacity is accounted for by three alliances but but elsewhere you know much less and and in africa you know you and i were talking earlier about this you know very large proportion of capacity that's with non-aligned legacy carriers are there opportunities here for um for alliances to get involved with new carriers or is it, is oh, it just a bit I think, so. I think so i think i think this uh this chart as much as anything else becca reflects the re the maturity of markets around the world and the difficulty of in some markets um to to grow outside of their, their own market region so having to use alliances you know three quarters of capacity about well, maybe 60 percent of capacity in north america is in the hands of the alliances uh, similarly in europe alliances have a, a relatively large share although low cost is growing and and it's interesting that you know in those markets that are more mature the alliances have a more established position um, and the two markets that strike me as being obvious places for further alliance development cooperation 
pragmatic code shares and bilateral agreements are the Indian subcontinent and Africa. You know, Africa still um, just under half of capacity is not connected, not aligned with any alliance, and yet it is one of the most difficult markets in the world to travel around uh, and connect through. So it's you know it's ripe for some form of connectivity. I think the only alliance. There's Egypt Air in Star, there's Kenya Airways in Sky Team. Um, you know, there are very few aligned carriers uh, in Africa at this moment in time. And and, and what about the, the future for the, the Middle East? We see things changing quite rapidly there with, a, you know, we, many of us, you talk about the Middle East, you tend to think of Etihad and, and Emirates and Qatar, but actually we've got lots of low-cost activity and we've got Saudi Arabia doing lots of interesting things as well, with just huge ambition. Um, are we going to see the need for a Saudi alliance member? Well, Saudi are a part of Sky Team anyway, um, so, you know, that's that's a tick box. Um, be interesting to see whether Riyadh Air, when it forms and starts operating next year, feels a need to be part of an alliance, and I think it would need to prove itself um, before it would be considered by an alliance. Um, Dow's, Dow's smiling, so maybe he knows something that we don't know. Um, and you know, I, I think everyone, everyone would, um, every alliance would be very keen on getting Emirates in some shape or form to to join or participate. Um, can't quite say the same for Etihad. I'm afraid it's not quite the same size and scale uh, that Emirates are. Dow, did you want to comment here on the sort of regional makeup of, of alliance or the sort of penetration of, of alliances in different parts of the world and where the opportunities are? No, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm aligned with the analysis from, from of John. Uh, small remark that the the the, the snapshot is going to be different if you come back next year or you know end of the year. Uh, things going to change uh, for sure for two reasons. First of all, there's some big uh, there's some cases that are ongoing uh, regarding. Uh, I would say a merger or consolidation. So if you look at Asia and Korean Air, uh, uh, next year when it's going to be over, it's going to change the, the uh, dominant position in Asia. If CZ decides to do one world, uh, one world, you're going to have also some modification there. The, the key point is uh, I do agree with Africa continent uh, uh, that uh, maybe because of the infrastructure. Uh, in the in Africa, we don't have a Nepal infrastructure good enough to optimize the connectivity. If one of those flag carriers join Scotty World War or Star. Yeah. Okay. Let's um. We've got another the next slide. We we look at some of the network gaps. But when we spoke about this between ourselves earlier today, or actually yesterday, we weren't convinced that perhaps this was showing the right. The right information but we thought we'd keep it here anyway as a sort of talking point just trying to understand where there are gaps in the network for each of the alliances and and actually just pointing out a gap doesn't really tell the full story you, you know if we look at india for instance there aren't there aren't easily identifiable airlines that could be alliance partners so you might have a gap but no possible domiciled airline, but that doesn't mean that you know Sky Team One World don't have a presence in India. They obviously have a lot of members flying into those places, so um, it, it's a bit more complicated, isn't it? And I think you've, you've said before, Dow, that you know that you have a, a an approach at Sky Team of working with the the main carrier or the challenger, and you know in a market like the UK where there's you know there's two legacy carriers really, then then that there's only options for two two alliances to have partnerships really. Yes, so for first of all for 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 sake of clarity, uh, here my 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 reading would be, is not the network gaps as such because all carriers, one war, scattering or, 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 or star, they are operating to the West Bank. Uh, even though, you know, like India, we don't have any member in India yet. However, if you look at the number of frequencies, we are operating more than, more than 10 frequencies per week. Uh, uh, if you look at scattered members, go in to from India. The gap here is more the market presence. So the commercial support 
of the home carriers in the country where you don't have any member. Uh, uh, so when you are uh, estimating uh, what are the synergies when we are estimating when one can join a global alliance is what is the dominant, what is the uh, market presence share of that carrier on his own market. So usually you should have Air France uh, dominant position in France, Lufthansa dominant position in Germany, etc. Uh, when you look at the market where we don't have any uh, uh, home carriers taking part of one of the three alliances, then we look at the weight of the carriers from each global agencies operating to from that country. And normally, yeah. uh, we is very rare that we are uh, looking for some factor from this market because they are small. So that's why we are looking more the white spot where we have a key factor and the key challenges and the flow are significant enough for us to explore a membership. And okay. it's quite interesting, uh, taking Dow's point a bit further. If you look at somewhere like London Heathrow, Becca, BA, uh, the One World Alliance has got 2.4 million seats this May. Um, um, Star has got just over 800,000 seats um, departing London Heathrow. So, you know, it's about a third the size. But the Star Alliance carriers are all in the same terminal, using the same facilities, and are actually more effectively grouped together than the One World carriers at Heathrow, who are split between three different terminals. Um, and you frequently find the carrier who is, or the alliance that is not the dominant alliance at an airport, works harder to coordinate its operations and to have all of its members in the same facility or the same terminal or the same space or the same satellite, whatever it happens to be, because it creates the commercial, it gives them a commercial advantage over the home carrier. You know, BA would, BA would obviously claim there's not enough space in Terminal 5 um, for all of the Alliance members. Some people, some people may argue it's because they don't want to share their crown jewels and their prized asset at Terminal 5 if it is a prized asset with other members of their group. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of detail here, isn't there, in trying to make these, I mean, what you're pointing to is that to make the alliances work to maintain that value for members takes a lot of a lot of detail, a lot of attention to detail um, in terms of how you work, and where you work, and um, exactly that, but you know, where you, how you work together at individual airports. And, you know, taking that point a, a stage further as to why you don't see more airlines joining these alliances, imagine Sky Team or Star Alliance identified an airline that they wanted to join who was already operating to Heathrow, but was in a different terminal. All of the work they would need to do to move that carrier to the to the terminal, to reschedule flights, to get slots, mm -hmm. gates, all of those things, horrendous. You know, for for how much revenue benefit that would be incremental to having a pure code share in place and a connecting product. Yeah, yeah, yep. Good point. Okay, we've still got a few more slides to go. We're we're running out of time rapidly. There's too much to say on this subject. Um, We've got a slide here just with the um, Sky Team network. I, I think what we'll do is, is move on from this. Uh, the, the networks are broadly, then if we looked at Star, if we looked at One World, they, they wouldn't look you know, so different in that they are trying to get some sort of worldwide coverage. So let's, let's move on to the next one. This one was, um, this is looking at on-time performance and it raised the question for me, because OAG has got on-time performance data, we had a look at on-time performance by alliance for a year to date and then for the top five airlines in each of, each of these groups, just to see if there were any differences. And we had an interesting conversation really about, um, you know, to what extent are operational things like this um, within the gift of the alliance is this something that it can influence you know we look at sky team we've talked a lot on these webinars about how well delta have done um delta's got a you know a great um on-time performance year to date of, of over 81 percent and a relatively low cancellation rate but are there is it possible to share best practice between alliance members or in in, in areas like on-time performance is it is it 
is too much a factor of geography and the individual airlines. So I think, John, that's your thinking, isn't it? That what Delta does can't be replicated at Air France or China Eastern in this respect. Not every every airline and its you know its operation has its own nuances and its own challenges that it has to face. Um, what I, I, my takeaways from this um, are some things that you know I've been reminded of in my past. Um, I think every alliance, when it vets or is looking at new members or partnerships, looks to see that the product consistency of the the airline they're in discussion with, or with whom they want a commercial relationship, has the same sort of values and the same sort of product specification that the existing members or partners do. You know, Sky Team wouldn't want to really bring a new member or a a partner to um, the table if their on-time performance is just 30%. Uh, it does, you know, it just it tarnishes the brand, um, and or it has a very high cancellation rate. Um, so there are many aspects that people perhaps don't realise or don't consider, and Dow can can share more. I'm sure, um, I'm sure on that basis. But I know in Sky Team, one of the criteria for Sky Team membership many years ago was a certain percentage of an airline mem uh, an airline's employees must be able to speak English. Um, on the front line, cabin staff, uh, customer services staff. So there was, you know, a common language that was consistent across all of the airlines. Um, and there are all sorts of all sorts of um, requirements um, that are in place. Um, and they're they're ambitious and they're they're not always possible to achieve. But but each of these alliances, it is about creating seamless connectivity with a like-minded group of airlines around the world who realise the commercial um, possibilities and opportunities by working together rather than working individually. Dow, I'm, ass I'm assuming you're going to agree with John there. Yeah, for full agree uh, on the key principle and the, the benefit of, uh, of the kind of uh, 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 KPI. But uh, I will not comment more on that because uh, I know that some carriers using the on-time performance as KPI is a salary calculation for for pilot. Uh, so depending on the criteria, it's a bit uh, subject a bit complex. Uh, so the on-time performance definition may differ from each airline. Yeah, yeah. In interesting discussion. You know how how far and why do um, do aspects of the operation. Are, are affect um, the alliance performance. Okay, we've got a couple more slides. Um, these are both what if. So one, we touched on this really, we've discussed it quite a bit already. You know, China, um, what if um, China Southern were to join One World? It would add, um, give them 17% share of uh, China capacity if they were to do so, compared to now where there's just about 0.4%. Obviously, when they're part of Sky Team, they'd have had a, a, a larger share again. Um, but, but there's a lot of, we, we've already said, haven't we, that it's it's taking time. And I think both of you, when I've spoken to you, John, you, you think it would happen sooner and Dow, you think there's more holding it back. So, John, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously two sides to the opportunity. The, um, from, from an external perspective, you, um, you can see, you know, that, that obviously they've decided to leave Sky Team for whatever reason. They're creating a hub in uh, Beijing, Daxing. BA have moved their own Beijing services to Daxing rather than Beijing Capital. One of the few airlines that have actually, international airlines that have actually done that. There is um, a couple of slots that BA had at Heathrow that apparently have been earmarked and allocated to China Southern or loaned to China Southern. So they can start flying Beijing London alongside Air China. You know, there's a lot of politicking going on between those two airlines that would suggest there is something in the offing. But Dow, to your point, it's really difficult to untangle yourself once you're in a in an alliance, isn't it? Yeah. So my 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 my, my personal analysis differ a bit. So first of all, all all of us we know the British Airways since a while uh, didn't get to China because of the slot issues as a capital airport. Uh, uh, however, however, at the very beginning discussion we had Skyteam with CAC, uh, uh, they, 
the authority has in mind to design the Dacian airport as the Skatim airport. Uh, and you see right now the structure of the Dacian airport. In one hand, it's China Eastern, in the other hand, it's China Southern. Uh, and and Air China will stay as a leader as a capital airport. Um, and then the problem, the problem it came. Um, Scottish members, we, we, some members are solicitating to leave from the capital airport to, uh, to join the Dacian airport or, 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 or stick of the uh, uh, capital airport. Most of Scottish carriers want to stick of the uh, Beijing airport so far because of the traffic closure. However, some of them are open the door to explore and also operating both. So meaning that they are operating Beijing from uh, Europe, uh, for the, from the Scottish home carriers to Beijing Capital Airport and Destiny Airport. But we have to recognize that the, the, the initial idea, which is the uh, Scottish Airport, has been diluted because of the presence of British Airways uh, as its airport. But now we are back to the recovery, and we need to establish the discussion again with the authority, uh, leading by China Eastern to claim that the, uh, the infrastructure of the Russian airports have been voluntarily discussed, agreed uh, as a SCATIM airport to ease the connection among all SCATIM carriers. So, CZ living to one world, I'm not fully sure because it's going to be tough for them also to have two different products in terms of quality of services. Uh, in one hand, with all World War members, and in the other hand, through the cooperation, the partnership they maintain with SCATI members. Oh, sorry, it goes to your point, John, doesn't it? You were saying earlier about uh, you know putting alliances in, in one terminal. It's um, very interesting. Yeah, and you know, doubt, doubt, there is a very important point about alliances and airline alliances. Um, and ultimately, the airline industry is a very people industry. And people within the industry know everyone else within the industry and builds relationships. And even when those members move out of alliances or co-chairs change and things, etc., there is there is relationships and affinities uh, that exist and, and stretch beyond the the normal commercial boundaries. You know, so Sometimes when you when China Southern may move out on a Sky Team Alliance, but they will they will have created so many personal and business relationships with members individually and collectively within the alliance that they will still have a degree of empathy and loyalty and want to do business with those people because they trust them and they've worked with them and they know how they work. It's a you know it's a very small knit industry we're actually in considering how many billions of people we carry around the world every year. And you are completely right, John. You are completely right, and most of that is the former CEO of China Eastern. Now is the CEO of China Southern. Yeah, yeah, and, and particularly in China, where you know the CEOs are government appointments, um, but they move around. Correct. Very, very interesting. We've, uh, I'm, I'm aware that once we go past the hour, um, people, people often leave leave and you've uh, scheduled an hour for the call. We've just got one more slide left, so please do stay with us if you can. Um, but if you need to leave, um, we will be back on Wednesday the 14th of June with the next webinar. But let's uh, let's have, see if we've got a few comments um, for this last slide. So we haven't got a what if China, we've got a what if Middle East. Now in the last uh, week, or was it two weeks now? Two weeks ago, um, Emirates and Etihad announced an incline agreement. And I know, John, you've written a blog for OEG about this. Um, um, I think it was OEG, was it? Or was it somebody else? Uh, uh, for someone else. You write a lot of the industry, but but you your view is is that this is just um, it's for show, really, isn't it? Yeah, this is gesturing, isn't it? This is showcasing. Not over substance. Showboating, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's a grand gesture um, to put this out though, and um, to say that this is to. Uh, further developed tourism in the United Arab Emirates is, is you know, a pretty hollow statement. There are millions of tourists in the United Arab Emirates. It's been a popular destination for decades. Is it really going to encourage more people to travel um, 
for tourism purposes to the UAE because you can go in one direction with Emirates and you can come out in the other with Etihad. No, you know. Um, and when when the signing signature or the signature um, ceremonial signing pictures um, actually have two UAE nationals um, signing it and the CEO, Sir Tim Clark, for instance, behind the picture, it tells you that this is more a bit of a politicking thing, uh, perhaps getting ahead of uh, what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia in the next 15 months. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Okay, we will um, we'll leave it there. Um, as I said a moment ago, do join us on the 14th of June for the next webinar. Um, you will get um, access to uh, the recording of the webinar um, and the slides after this, so um, look out for those. Um, do sign up to OEG's blogs and regular updates on uh, uh, what's happening in the industry. It's all available on the website and uh, through these links here. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Dow and John, for all your comments and insight today. Um, have a good week. Bye then. Hey, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.